speak to us once again. All right, out tonight, <clears throat> if you have a Bible, turn to Joshua chapter 24. Joshua chapter 24. And my subject tonight <clears throat> is Old Soldiers Never Die. That's a song they sing at West Point. And at West Point, they sing, Old Soldiers Never Die, Never Die, Never Die. Old Soldiers Never Die, They Just Fade Away. <laughs> and the idea behind that sentiment is that <clears throat> there's something peculiar about combat in that if a man gets through about three engagements, he usually gets through 50. The kind of fellows that get shot in combat usually get shot in the first or second engagement. And those fellows that get through engagement after engagement after engagement, most of them never get killed in battle. Most of them uh, don't get to die with their boots on. And it's a pity when you talk to them. My father was a colonel in World War II and a captain in World War I, and his ambition was to die with his boots on. They all want to die in combat, you know. And they never do. They always outlive combat, and they get old, and they get gray-headed, and they're Arch is falling, their stomach comes down, they get cancer or something, die in pneumonia, get hit with a truck. <laughs> you take old General Patton with all he went through in Sicily, <clears throat> all he went through coming up through Europe, you think that Patton sooner or later would get shot in combat, but he wasn't. You take Patton, he's one of the few generals I've ever heard of that ride a lead tank. <laughs> generals, you don't find them in lead tanks, but you'd find him up there. You take Rommel out there in Africa, He'd be standing up sometime in a barrage where every fellow he was talking to was down in some kind of a slit trench or a foxhole, and he'd stand up there and talk to them while the barrage was coming in. Seem almost invulnerable. He'd take a, he'd take a scout car up alongside a tank and tap it, and the tank commander would come out, and Rommel would say, why don't you go on in the town? And the tank commander said, I think there's an anti-tank gun in there. And Rommel would drive into the town and come back with a wheel shot off and a dead driver and come back and wrap the tank and said, you're right, there's two of them. There's one right there and one right there. <laughs> That's the way he was. You'd have a hard time uh, killing him. They never did kill him. When Rommel died, the Gestapo rode up in front of his house and took him out in the car and said, okay, we'll give you your choice. You can take these pills and die and we'll say you got killed in a car wreck or a plane shot you down or something. Or else, uh, if you don't take these pills, we'll put you in the concentration camp and put your kids in with you and then execute you. So he took the pills. And you take Rommel when his body lay in state. His wife passed by the body, and she said to people who knew her after the war, she said, when I saw him lying there in the casket, she said, I saw a look on his face like I've never seen in his face. She said, I've seen all kinds of looks on his face in the years I've known him. But she said, I've never seen such a look of contempt in all my life. He was sneering at the people who killed him. The state sculptor for Nazi Germany sent his widow a letter and said, we're going to make a statue of your husband, commemorate him as a great hero. Uh, it seemed to me to be appropriate to have a lion of some kind. Would you like to have a, a lion about the spring or perhaps a wounded lion with an arrow in him? And Mrs. Rommel never answered. They took old Rommel his body out there. They gave him a big funeral and big to-do of the state. Had the band play, Ishata and Kamerad, you know, and white gloves and the whole works. But they killed him. He didn't die in combat. Didn't die in combat. Those old fellows, they never die in combat. Bull Halsey didn't die in combat. Stillwell didn't die in combat. MacArthur didn't die in combat. <clears throat> MacArthur got back to the states and had to face a bunch of politicians in the Korean War. That's what we lost our shirt in Korea. Viet Vietnam was an afterthought. We lost it in Korea. And you take MacArthur, when he got back, he stood up before the West Pointers. When he got up there and got through with his closing message, they all stood and sang, old soldiers never die, never die, never die. Old soldiers never die, they just fade away. You take old Pat and the truck hit in. I've got written the margin of my Bible and the margin of all my notebooks at home, a little German inscription. And it says, <clears throat> it says, Nish Vergessen Pips Priller, Joseph Priller. You say, who was Joseph Pips Priller? Well, after the war, he was a brewer. He ran a beer company. <laughs> you say, was he saved? No, he wasn't saved, as far as I know. You say, what's his name doing in all your Bibles? 
Well, when the Allied invasion came in on D-Day in Normandy, they had 13,000 aircraft in the air. Light bombers, heavy bombers, pursuits, gliders, supply planes, 13,000. One, one German plane went up to meet him. <clears throat> he had his wingman with him, two of them. He had his batman with him. One plane went up to meet him. I was driven by a lieutenant named, the Luftwaffe named Joseph Pips Puller. <laughs> he went up and took on 13,000 aircraft. <laughs> Pretty good man, wouldn't you say? <laughs> you know, I wish God would take some of that and put it in me. You saw how Pips died. Oh, he went back to Germany after World War II and had a heart attack in 1961. That was the end of it. Old soldiers never die. They just fade away. Now, first of all, take your Bible there and get Joshua chapter 24, verse 29. Joshua chapter 24, verse 29. And in Joshua 24, 29, the Lord says, uh, And it came to pass after these things <clears throat> that Joshua, the servant of the Lord, died being 110 years old. Joshua died, got old and died. He didn't die in combat. That fellow was in combat most of his life. But, and the first time you find that fella, he's in battle. <clears throat> I think sometimes people, uh, they uh, don't understand the rougher element of our civilization that gets saved. And uh, I can understand why they don't, since both of them live such soft lives. But certain men have been fighting all their life. It's hard for them to quit fighting. They get, they get in the habit. You take your Bible and turn to Exodus 17, I'll show you something. Exodus 17. Exodus 17, verse 9 and 10. And in Exodus 17, verse 9 and 10, the first time you see Joshua, he's in battle. He's fighting the Lord's battles. The first time his name is mentioned in the Bible is in Exodus, chapter 17, verse 9 and 10. In Exodus chapter 17, verse 9 and 10, that old war horse there appears for the first time in the Word of God. And when he appears, he's fighting against uh, Amalek at the Battle of Rephidim. And in Exodus chapter 17, verse 9 and 10, there up shows old Joshua, and Joshua's fighting the Lord battles. And he fights the Lord battles till the day he dies. Fought him at Ai, fought him at Jericho. Fella fought all his life. Uh, the chance of him getting killed in combat were just as good as your chance of uh, going out there in the street and uh, crossing the street without getting hit. And he never did get him. He died of old age, 110 years old. You take Joshua, first time he shows up in battle, and he's been fighting all his life. Some men are like that. I've known boxers to get saved, professional boxers. And one of them in particular, when he got saved and came to the altar and knelt down, somebody asked him what he wanted, and he said, I want a new manager. <laughs> see, that's how they think, you see. He'd just been fighting for so long, he didn't think about Christ as a savior. He thought about him as a manager. <laughs> I know a gangster up in, a uh, in converted gangster up in uh, Flint, Michigan that preaches, and when he came down to get saved, the person, the worker, knelt beside him and said, what do you want? He said, I want to be a chief lieutenant. <laughs> I mean, that was the policeman. That was the fellow who was always giving him a hard time. To him, a chief lieutenant was a big shot, and he was sick and tired of being a criminal and hunted, and he wanted to be somebody. Now, some of you don't understand that, see, but I understand that. I've seen bums come down the mission... Uh, come down there in the mission, kneel down there, and the person, the worker, knelt down beside him and said, what do you want? What do you want? And the old bum says, I want to get on the, on the gravy train. Let me on the gravy train. <laughs> now, maybe that wouldn't mean nothing to you, see, but that means give me the best you got, see? That's, he's asking for eternal life. He just doesn't know how to ask for it, see? He says, let me on the gravy train. You take those old boys that fight. Sometimes they fight for so long they can't get the fight out of the system long after it's supposed to get out. You take old Joshua, he fought all his life, fought all his life. Now, that isn't all. He had a mountaintop experience. Take your Bible and turn to Exodus chapter 24 and look at verse 13. Exodus 24, verse 13. I know very few men <clears throat> that God ever used in the ministry that somewhere in their life didn't have a mountaintop experience. Now, they may not talk about it too much. It's dangerous to talk about when you begin to talk about the experience you've had with the Lord, there's always a danger somebody else will try to counterfeit your experience or imitate your experience, and then uh, they'll counterfeit the fruit without the root. 
But every man I've ever known that God ever used in the history of the church had some terrible engagement where he came close to God or came close to the devil and got into a hair-raising experience that raised a hair in your head if you had any to raise. <laughs> and that's the trouble. You give a fellow a hair-raising experience, and if he's bald, he can't have the same one you have, so there's no any sense to tell him about it. <laughs> But I, I, I don't know any man I've ever talked to like Beach and Beck or like uh, J. Frank Norris or Bob Jones Sr. or Dallas Billings or any of those fellows or any of the fellows in past church history like Martin Luther or John Wesley or George Whitfield that didn't come to some place in their life where they had a definite experience with the Lord after they were saved. Now, I know some of these dumb charismatics called the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but that's because they haven't got any sense. And beside that, these of charismatics don't have what they profess to have because they don't have any power. All the charismatics you've got in this town couldn't bring revival to this town. In Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, there was 120, 120, see, that professed to have the baptism of the Holy Ghost to speak in tongues, 120. And they revived the whole town of Jerusalem. America has over four million of those people that can't even close a liquor store. You know what the trouble is? No power. It's trouble, no power. Just talk. Oh, just the power, the power. Don't kid me. Don't kid me. Don't kid me. You lead people to cry as soon as you get them saved, that bunch comes around. They come around after you get them saved. I've been, I've been saved 30 years. I've never seen a charismatic yet come up to a fellow and put his finger in his face and say, if you don't repent of your sin and trust Jesus, you're going to burn in hell. I've never heard it one time. You know why? Gutless. No spine. No backbone. Amen, 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 and amen. All this stuff. You think I'm kidding me? You think I'm kidding you? Why don't you try me out? I'll go out with you. Off it takes some of those fellows get down there and preach them on the street. They're all thumbs, man. They don't know what to do. They'll wait for you to start first, and then they'll come around the next Saturday. Yeah, uh, you bet your booties, baby. <laughs> now, you take that stuff. I never know anybody that God ever used that didn't have a mountaintop experience of some kind. They don't often talk about it. I don't often talk about mine. I, I had an encounter with the Lord after I was saved. Must have been a couple of, just a couple of weeks after, which to this day I don't fully understand and don't profess to fully understand, I don't talk about it. You won't find it in my books. I've written 17 books, and you won't find it even mention those books. Uh, you know, most men who've been in combat and been through a hair-raising experience don't like to talk about it. It's hard to get them to talk about it. You say, why? For two reasons. The reason when you find a fellow who's been in combat a lot, one reason he doesn't like to talk about combat is because when combat starts, your adrenaline gets going through your system. And you get moving, man. You move. <laughs> and when a guy gets talking about what he's been through, that old stuff comes back. I've seen him. I've seen an old boy been over there in combat in Korea, and he's telling me about a mess he got in there one night. And he's a good fella. He's saved, I believe. He lives down there in Pensacola. He's saved, but about once every four or five months, he gets just drunk as a skunk. <laughs> You say the fellow's saved? Yeah, I think he's saved. <laughs> he just has it rough. He's a little fellow, about five feet four, and about once every four or five months he'll go out and get drunk, get in a fight someplace. Many have phoned me up three o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning. I've come and find my living room one o'clock in the morning sitting there crying and said, oh, Peter did it again and did it again, didn't mean to, and oh, what's the matter with me? The devil has got a hold of me. And I put my arm around that guy many a time and said, listen, man, I said, you've already proved you're a man. Quit trying to prove it. See, his trouble, he just got this complex about not being a man. I said, you've been in combat 16 months. You don't have to prove nothing. Relax, rest, you know. He gets shaken, you know. He sit there and he'd tell me about it. He'd say, well, Pete, I was going down this trench. And he said, I was running down this trench with this ammunition box. And he said, I had an old dull bayonet that you cut the, you know, the, 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 the bands they put around those ammo boxes. And he said, I ran into a goop coming down that trench. And he said, he had a machine pistol with him. And we... Grabbed right together, had to hang on to him, drop the box, and it's that machine pistol was going off with a, with a bolt going off between the two of us here, rubbing them in my stomach and spraying bullets all over the place. And he said, I tried to stick him with that bayonet, and it was dull, and I couldn't puncture him. <laughs> and that guy said, it was one of those quilted winter uniforms, you know, I was hacking away at him and couldn't get the thing through. And he said, if I pulled away from him and got away from him, he'd shoot me. And he said, finally I got the thing and stabbed him and killed him, you know. And while he was talking about that, I watched him, you know. 
And he began to go. <laughs> you know what he'd do? He'd live it all over again, man. He'd going through it again. That's why they don't like to talk about it. I'll tell you something else. Another reason they don't like to talk about it. They don't like to talk about it because every man, when he gets into combat, sooner or later realizes he's somewhat of a coward. You get the fire scared out of you, man. <laughs> a man that isn't scared in combat's a fool. Did you ever? You, some of you never been in combat. You wonder how to how to get a taste of it. You wait till an electric storm comes up, a little electric thunderstorm with a lot of lightning. Go out there in a golf course and just walk around a while in it, <laughs> and get that thing. Bam! You know, boom! Bam! Boom! <laughs> It'll get you praying, man. Get you praying. <laughs> you know, one time there in that Vietnam mess, that Vietnam mess, <clears throat> after what they had, what they call the Tet Offensive, and the Chinese came in, or the Vietnam came in and tore the place all to pieces. After that thing was over, a general was in there with an inspection. You know, they have a lot of that stuff afterwards. And he was talking about when the attack came and the bombardment came there in the rear headquarters. He was talking to all the rear echelon and find out what they did. And he called in one clerk there, and he said, when this bombing and bombardment started, what did you do? And he said, well, he said, I sounded the alarm in the vicinity of the building, and I initiated a thorough inspection of the office and checked all classified material to see the documents were secured. I locked the safe, inspected the security files, and see that they were closed, and then I followed the usual precautions and donned my combat gear and made an orderly exit to the bunker. <laughs> and the general said, son, how long take you to do that? He said about 12 seconds. <laughs> I'm that stuff come there, man. you going to move. I remember one night I was talking to the fellow. His name was Don Phillips. He was down in Middletown, Ohio. He was a Marine. He's captured the Japanese. He was on a boat there where the Japs took him up there. Eventually they wound up in, up there in uh, Manchukuo someplace, up around Korea. And you take old Don Phillips when he was taken captured by the Japanese, he and a bunch of Marines. The Americans came over and dropped bombs on the Japanese ships. And when they did, they drowned a lot of Marines. Of course, that can't be helped. Fortunes of war and all that. But anyway, he and a bunch of fellows piled out of their ship that was sinking one night and swam ashore, 300 of them, and they got in the school of sharks. And he swam ashore, he said, with men screaming and those things splashed around in the dark. In the dark, man. And he got talking about that thing. When he got through that thing, I asked a stupid question. You know, I, I knew it was stupid as soon as I asked it. I said to him, I said, well, how far did you swim? <laughs> That's a dumb thing to ask a guy on a thing like that. He didn't know how far he swam. <laughs> and he said, <clears throat> I don't know how far I swam. I might have swum 100 yards or 200 yards a mile, man. He said, you don't think about how far you're swimming in a mess like that. And I thought to myself, yeah, that's right. That's a dumb thing to ask, you know. How far did you swim? Big old black fin in the water, and guys screaming, legs and arms going everywhere, and that thing chasing you. Boy, you turn into an Olympic swimmer and a thing like that, I'll tell you, boy. <laughs> now, they don't like to talk about that because it arouses old memories and brings back old things, and they get excited again. All right, that isn't all. You take old uh, Joshua, he succeeded a great man. Take your Bible and turn to Joshua 1, verse 2. Joshua 1, verse 2. He succeeded a great man. I am glad <clears throat> when the Lord called me, he didn't call me to fill Moses' shoes. But in Joshua chapter 1, verse 12, the Lord says there, he says to Joshua, he said, my servant Moses is dead. Now you've got to take these people over Jordan. Do you know who Joshua was called to replace? He was called to replace Moses. Why, Moses is the greatest character in the Old Testament outside of Elijah. When the Bible speaks about the law and the prophets, it speaks about Moses and Elijah. And when Joshua is called, Joshua is called to take the place of the greatest character in the Old Testament. That's quite somebody's shoes to fill. Did you ever think about uh, what might happen someday? The Lord might call you to fill somebody's shoes. You know, one time, I suppose you looked up here sometime, Brother Modlish wasn't here. If the Lord dies, he'll get old, die one of these days. Maybe an accident might happen to him. Some of you have to take his place. Reckon any of you able to do it? Pretty big job. You know when J. Frank Norris died, they tried to find somebody to fill his shoes. You couldn't get anybody to fill J. Frank Norris' shoes. 
They just don't make them that big. Bob Jones Sr. died. When Bob Jones Sr. died, you couldn't get by to fill his shoes either. You take son, son may mean well, but you study the history of the church, and you won't find one son, one junior, that ever took his father's place successfully. Do you know why that is? Because when the old man came up through, he came up through a pedagogy and persecution and trouble and privation, but the boy didn't. You take Dr. DeHaan. Dr. DeHaan and Richard DeHaan are not the same preacher. You take Charlie Fuller and Dan Fuller, they're not the same preacher. You take Bob Jones Sr. and Bob Jones Jr., they're not the same preacher. Don't kid me, go kid yourself. You know why that is? Because when the old man came up, he had to blaze a trail and take a custom out and persecution and privation, and it builds character. And you can't get character when you get saved. They're unsaved people in Rochester have more character than some of you Christians. Anybody can get saved. You can get saved just like that. See? But you don't get character just like that. It takes a long time to build character. You say, how do you get character? You get character by doing things you don't like to do. You know how you get character? You get character by doing what you don't want to do. That's how you get character. We have a guy come down to our school, and he's a hothead and a fanatic and a street preacher and a spirit-filled fellow and a prayer warrior, you know, and go get him, boy, a great soul winner and visitation expert. We make him study Greek. That cools him off, boy. <clears throat> We get some guy down there as an intellectual, you know, just all bookish and all glasses and all books and all intellectual, got a law up here. You know what we do? We make him preach on the street. That's how you develop character. You know how you develop character? By doing what you don't want to do and don't like to do. Now, you take old Joshua. He had to fill a great man's shoes. And I thank God I didn't have to fulfill Moses' shoes. Boy, you stop about thinking the steps of Moses. Now, that's something. That fellow took on Pharaoh, drowned him in the Red Sea. That's the man that brought the children of Israel up out of the land of Egypt. That was a great man. You think about having to take his place. And that's what Joshua had to do. He had to take Moses' place. When a commander dies in battle, you can't always get a replacement for him. You take when Hitler got mad at Guderian and ran him off, he didn't ever get a man back as good as Guderian. Not in that outfit. When he ran off General Modell and Howler and those fellows, you can't replace those fellows. Back then in World War II, when the American troops were coming into Germany, they went through a village called Sterling Wendell, Sterling Wendell. And they came through there. There was an I Company of the 324th Assault Regiment, and they had a, a first lieutenant in charge of that company, company commander C.O. Schott, and his name was Wilson. And Wilson was one of these schoolboy kind of uh, leaders. He was a, I mean, he was a field manual type of leader. The men made fun of him, but they admired him. He had guts. Lieutenant Wilson didn't smoke. He didn't drink. He didn't curse. When he'd lead his troops in battle, he'd say, okay, I'll show you how to do it. Follow me. Short rushes. He'd get up and hit the ground, roll over, get up and run, hit the ground, roll over, follow me. He'd show them how to do it. He wouldn't say, follow that sergeant. He'd say, follow me and show them how to get through. And the men admired him. They kidded about him, you know, a lot. They call him a boy, you know, and call him a kid and all this and that. But they got after where, why would they follow him anywhere? They knew he had nerves. And they came to Stirring Vendel and got in there. And when they got in there, uh, Lieutenant Wilson fought his way with his company up through a bunch of houses there, house to house firing, level to level, floor to floor firing. And he got up opposite the window and got trying to pick up a sniper. And the sniper got him first and hit him right in the chest. And that lieutenant fell down the floor and kicked a table across the floor, and with his last dying breath, he was telling those fellows, slap me, slap me in the face. I'm losing conscious. Slap me in the face. And they slapped him in the face, but he went. Pretty soon he was dead. And after that battle was over, they brought his back, back there, a body back in a mattress cover. And as they came in and put it down, the troops sat around there, and they were all glum and gloomy, and one of them said, well, where are we going to get another like him? They're going to send some 90-day wonder from OCS. Where are we going to get another like Wilson? It's going to be hard to get. It's going to be hard to get. One of these days, the old guard will pass, and the new guard will have to take the place. Any replacements? 
I preached this message up at Beach and Vicks Church in uh, Detroit about uh, two or three years ago, and I didn't know it, but I guess the Lord leads you in things like that. I didn't know it, but he was going to be dead in nine months. And he was sitting up there on the platform, and I was preaching this message, old soldiers never die, they just fade away. And I told those people up there, I said, you know, one of these days, you just have to look up on this platform, be an empty seat sitting over here, and then who will take his place? Hard takes place. Old soldiers never die, they just fade away. All right, take your Bible and turn to Joshua chapter 6, verse 26. And in Joshua chapter 6, verse 26, you learn something else about Joshua. Joshua was a prophet. He was a prophet. The old-time preachers and the old-time crusaders were not just preachers. They weren't just pastors. They weren't just evangelists. They were prophets. A prophet tell what's going to take place. I don't mean a prophet like Salem Caravan or Lindsay making money off the late great planet. I don't mean like that. I mean, a prophet would stand up and warn the people what was going to take place and tell them to get ready and tell them who was responsible and name names. He'd say, so-and-so, so-and-so, and so-and-so. And so. The old-time fellows like Mordecai Ham were like that. They didn't hesitate to name names. This modern bunch, I'm telling you, this modern bunch, some of these preachers, if you gave them a 10-pound sledgehammer, they couldn't bust a butterfly's wing with it. They stand up there and they say, now if we accept Christ as our Savior, and God is so good to us, and if we will just repent of our sins, shut your mouth, you coward. Listen, I'm saved, and it's not if we repent, it's I have repented and trusted Christ, and if you haven't, you need to. <laughs> there no we to it. I ain't with you. That's the thing we got. We got a generation where the preacher wanted to identify himself with all the lost people so they'll think kindly of him. <laughs> I don't care what you think about me. If you're unsaved, you need to repent, and you need to get right, you need to trust Christ, and it ain't us, it ain't us, because I already have. <laughs> and I was to it. They're so busy sharing things, you know. They're trying to share the salvation. You can't share salvation. God gives you salvation. Sharing. I get so sick and tired of hearing that thing. Preachers in the air. And now thank for this time we had to share with you. And we'd like to share a few verses with you. And last week we shared with you this portion. And today we're happy to have a little time to share with you this verse, which we'd like to share with you. That's the most sickening thing. I didn't come here to share nothing with you. I came here to preach at you. <laughs> That's right, man. I didn't come here to share an offering with you. I came to get one. <laughs> yeah, man. All this stuff, share, 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 all that communist stuff. You never read that in the Bible. You never read that in the Bible, that sharing bit. That's some of that communist stuff. This man was a prophet, called names. The old-time preachers, they'd call names. I mean, they'd, they'd tell you what the trouble was and, and, and name it. <clears throat> you got a generation of people always trying to cover up or trying to pretend the trouble isn't there or something like that. Boy, it's some generation. These people in the radio, newscasters, announcers, politicians. Well, if we lower off the tariff, we can stop inflation. If we raise the tariff, we can stop inflation. If we change the import laws, we can stop inflation. If everybody get together and fight inflation, if everybody can... Listen, 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 listen. You know how to stop inflation? Quit printing funny money. <laughs> you know how to quit printing funny money? Quit spending more money than what you have. Amen. All this stuff. I mean, commentators discussing that thing just so serious, a heart attack, man, and just sitting around there acting like profound, thinking if we just do this and then just do this, why, anybody in a sense take that thing and turn it off. The way to get rid of inflation is quit printing money that isn't any good. <laughs> And the way to quit printing money that ain't no good is quit spending money you don't have. I can tell you how to get rid of inflation. Take all the congressmen, congressmen cut the salaries in half. <laughs> they make pretty good money anyway. How about the president? Cut him in about a tenth, okay? You don't be beautiful to make a law that nobody could be president unless they were making less than $20,000 a year when they got elected. See? 
I mean, that way you wouldn't have a lot of competition, all these rich folks trying to get in. Kennedy for president. <laughs> you mean to tell me in a country man that's $800 billion in debt, you put a guy in there that never had to worry about fixing the screen door or paying a phone bill or changing a tire in a car or fixing the leaky commode, he wouldn't make any no kind of president. What you want to put in there is some guy that ran an independent gas station. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, brother. That's right. Or a, or a small grocery store. Get one like that. Make it a rule, you know, if a fellow's going to be present, he, ca he can't make any more, he can't make any more money than the national average income. It'll discourage a lot of folks from getting to be president. All this stuff. The old time fellows were prophets, and they spoke up and said, Here's the trouble, and they named the trouble, and told you what the trouble was, and they named names. But he was human as all prophets. Take you by him and turn to Exodus 32. He was a great man, and he was a prophet, but the prophets are like nature with us. The Bible says a man, that Elijah was a man subject to like passions as us. And you take the prophets are human. They're not sinless. You take the prophets, they made mistakes. Why do you realize that old Joshua, with all his boldness and all his valor and all his desire to serve the Lord, you realize that fellow was mistaken about his own calling? That guy was called to be a soldier. And you realize even what guy was called to be a soldier, he was mistaken one time about his own calling. Look at that passage there in Exodus chapter 32, 17. They're coming down the mount there. And they're coming down there, and when they get coming down there, you know what uh, Joshua says? He says, there's a sound of war in the camp. <laughs> See? He's a soldier. He's been fighting. And he hears that screaming down there, and he says, it's war. You know what Moses says? He said, it's the sound of singing <laughs> and dancing. I mean, isn't that, isn't that something? There that guy was called to be God's soldier and was fighting all his life, and yet he didn't, know, he didn't even know the sound of battle when he heard it. <laughs> Of course, you can't blame me. They're probably having a rock concert down there, you know, and dance around that statue, you know, and I'm a good, a good, a good, a good, a good, a good, you know, all wobbling around like a bunch of rubber ducks on a stilt. And you take with all that, <clears throat> you take with all that stuff going on down there, you couldn't blame Josh for making a mistake. I mean, some of this modern singing just sound like a guy getting stuck in the gut with a bayonet. <laughs> you know, back in those days, we teach them to stick him. You don't take that thing and stick it in. When you stick it in, you're supposed to yell, you know, you go, and you stick that thing in, see? And the idea is when he screams, you don't hear him, see? Um, you scream, get your courage up. I've heard some music that sounds just like that. I mean, uh, you know, I, I'm partially deaf. Some of you probably gathered that by now. I got uh, a firecracker went off my right ear when I was about 14 and finished an eardrum. And then when I was about, uh, oh, about 36, 37, Asiatic flu, got the other one. So I have a hard time hearing, and sometimes it's a blessing. I can hear the noise, but I can't distinguish the words. And when I hear this stuff over radio, I don't know what they're singing. I hear, I saw him against him, 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 I saw I'm what they're saying, man, I'm just amazed. You know. That's got its advantages, brother. <laughs> they're all talking in tongues. <laughs> And you take old Joshua, you take old Joshua, when he comes down there off that mount, he says, it's the voice of, of battle, and Moses says, no, it's singing. But you can, you can see why it is. These guys get it in front of this microphone and go, I'm a dirty bed and bed and bed. You know, I'm an old <laughs> <laughs> in the gut, man. <laughs> and listen, that fellow wasn't only deceived about his own calling, not only deceived about his own calling, he was deceived about the Holy Spirit. Take your Bible, look at Joshua chapter 9, verse 14. Joshua 9, 14. Why the Holy Spirit came down and came upon the elders in the camp. When the Holy Spirit came down upon the elders in the camp, uh, Joshua comes up to Moses, he's all upset. And he says, forbid him. Don't let him prophesy. And Moses says to Joshua, enviest thou for my sake? And he said, would God the Lord pour out his spirit and all his people and they'd prophesy. Now you take old Josh, we want to help out. But he was wrong about that thing. He was deceived about that thing. He thought it was harmful for those fellows to prophesy there in the camp. And Moses said, I wish to God I had all of them prophesying. 
Now that shows even though a man may be a great man, a spirit-filled man, he can still be mistaken about some things. And you take old Joshua, old Joshua was mistaken, uh, and occasionally deceived. Now that isn't all. Take your Bible and turn to Joshua chapter 7, and in Joshua chapter 7, look at verse 7. That's one of the strangest verses in the whole Bible. You wouldn't think that a man as powerful as Joshua was and as brave as he was would ever get backslidden, would you? But he did. You wouldn't think a man that wasn't afraid to take on the angel of the Lord, you wouldn't think he'd ever get the place where he'd get afraid and play the coward, would you? But he did. I want you to look at that passage in Joshua chapter 7, verse 7. That's right after they went up to Ai and fought and got the tar whipped out of them, and they came back in a retreat. And when they came back in a retreat, you know where Joshua is? Joshua is down on his face, down on his face before the Ark of the Covenant, and he's saying, Oh God, would God be to stay on the other side of Jordan? And there he's complaining and hollering and whimpering, just like the spies that lost faith. Imagine Joshua in that kind of condition. Now, you know what there is not for you? There's a great lesson. You realize no matter how spiritual a man is, no matter how great a man is in the ministry, and what kind of a soldier of the cross he is, there are times in his life when he's ready to quit. The study of old Moses, one of the greatest studies in the Word of God. Every time old Moses turns around, he's about ready to quit. And saying, take me, O Lord, I'm not better than my fathers, and if you will forgive me, okay, and if not, kill me out of sight. And old Moses is saying, I can't bear all this people, it's too heavy a burden, and you've got to take this burden off my back, I can't stand it. Moses has time with him. Uh, the study of Moses, to me, is one of the greatest studies in the Word of God, in the ministry, and it shows what a minister is up against. Now, you talk about a Sunday school, that bird was running two million in the Sunday school. That's a big Sunday school, you know that. Two million and no buses. <laughs> and that guy, <laughs> that guy was running two million, and he, and he took it out of the convention. <laughs> I mean, he took it out of Egypt, right? And got out there in the wilderness. They had no sustenance. And they got out there, and the scorpions after him, and the snakes at him. And then Cor, Dathan, and Abiram rose up and tried to take it away from him. You know, a man said one time, he said, the reason why the average pastor that has a big church is a dictator is he has to spend all his time putting down dictators. <laughs> There's a lot of truth in that, a lot of truth in that. There's always somebody trying to take over and run things. He has the ground open on him, going down the fire, all that kind of stuff. Boy, what a congregation. <laughs> what a congregation, man. You take his right-hand man, Aaron, down there building a golden calf while he's going away on the manualistic tour. <laughs> what a thing, man. And that guy, he got the place. I bet you there's many a night where Moses came into his tent and fell on his face and said, God, I just can't stand. I just can't go a foot further. I'm quitting. And the Lord put him to sleep mercifully and give him a little bit of rest, which he probably needed. Sometimes that's all you need. And then he'd get up the next day and go at it again. Now, you take old Joshua. Joshua's a great man. And Joshua was a brave soldier, and he's carrying with the faithful, and we'll talk about that more later. But there were times he got so discouraged, he was ready to quit. And that passage you're reading right there, he's down on his face before the Ark of the Covenant, and he is ready to cash in his chips and quit, and throw in the towel and quit. I don't care how brave a soldier is. I don't care how strong he is, how many battles he's been through. There'll be times when he'll just feel like sitting down and bawling. You take old Eric Marie Remarque, he's gone now. Old soldiers never die, they just fade away. Eric Marie Remarque was a Alsace Lorraine German in World War I that wrote one of the ten best selling books in the world. He wrote a book called All Quiet in the Western Front. All Quiet in the Western Front is the definitive novel for modern warfare. But if you read that one book, you can put aside the other 30 you picked up, they're all patterned after that one. And you take Eric Marie Remarque when he writes about his book about a bunch of young German boys there toward the end of World War I. He's writing about the experience of young Paul Baumer who comes home and goes on, goes on leave and comes home and spends leave at home and sees his mother for the first time many months and she's suffering with cancer. And he sees his sister. And in that dialogue, that monologue that Marie Remarque writes, he says in the first person, I go to my room. Here are my books. They still stand on the shelf on the wall where I left them before I became a soldier. He said, I look at my books. I, somehow or another, I have to think myself back into this scene I was in before I was 
uh, in the army. I've got to get rid of these impressions. I'll think myself back. I stand before my books. I look at them. I stand there mute, helpless. I say, speak to me, speak to me, speak to me. They spoke to me once. They speak no more. I pick up the pages, words, words. I pull them back on the shelf. I stand there like a condemned criminal. I can't get back. <laughs> can't get back. At night time, he's lying in the bed there, and his mother comes in and sits by the bed, and he pretends like he's asleep. She figures she'll, he figures she'll go away. She doesn't go away. She sits there the long hour of the night and by the bed there and prays for him, pats his head, and finally he's worried about her getting cold, and he wakes up, or acts like he's waking up, and says, Mother, you've got to get back to bed. Don't worry about me. I'm all right. I'll be all right. Go back to bed, Mother. You must take care of yourself, Mother. And his mother says, Paul, is it, is it bad out there? And he says to himself, ah, mother, mother, is it bad out there? This is my mother asking this question. She doesn't know what she's saying. Is it bad out there? Shall I tell her about those recruits we found, all blue in the face for they swallowed gas? No, mother, I say, it's not bad out there. So I'll be all right. And then his mother says, Paul, if you should get a chance to work in the kitchen, don't worry about what the other men think. <laughs> And Paul says in his heart, he says, Oh, mother, mother, you think I'm still a child. Oh, mother, mother, what a wretched world this is. Here you're the only one who has a right to me and more claims on me than anybody. And now we've got to depart. And how shall I ever leave you, mother? And she says, And Paul, you need to look out for those French women, Paul. They're bad. Ah, mother, mother, you think I'm still a child. Why can't I go back and be a child once more and cry upon your bosom? Old Paul goes back there and goes back into combat, old Paul Bomber. When he gets back in combat, he gets crawling out there between the lines at night and out in the trenches, and he loses his way. And he gets out there, and he's afraid if he goes the wrong way, he'll get in the wrong trench and get torn all to pieces. And he falls into a shell hole there, and when the counterattack comes through, a Frenchman comes in on top of him, and he plays like he's dead, putting his head down in the mud of the shell hole, and the Frenchman falls, and he stabs him to death. Then he pulls off back from him, the sunlight comes up the next morning, he has to sit there and watch the fellow die. Takes him all day to die. Pretty soon his mind begins to leave him. He goes over and says, Comrade, when I get back, I'll fix things up. I promise you, Comrade, I'll. Opens up the billfold, wife, two kids, Duval, the printer. He opens it up and he says, Duval, the printer, I'm a printer, I must be a printer. And a little bit later in the afternoon, he says, I'm more calm now. I'm no longer hysterical. I speak calmly to the corpse, and I say, Monsieur Duval, when I get back, we'll fix this thing up. Brave man. Shot all to pieces. Listen, there's something about Christian work. If you're going to be in the front line for the Lord and fight for God and stand for something, it's going to wear you out. You better not think you're Superman. You better learn how to rest. You better learn how to relax. You better learn how to come apart or else you'll come apart. <clears throat> Christ says, let us come apart for a while, you know. You better learn how to come apart or you'll come apart. All right, he was backslidden, old Joshua. But he was counted with a faithful remnant. That's the main thing. Counted with a faithful remnant. Take your Bible and turn to Joshua chapter 5, 13. Joshua chapter 5, 13. In Joshua chapter 5, 13, old Joshua's out there on the hillside. He looks up there and he sees a man there with a sword standing over across him. You know what Joshua does? He pulls out his sword and he goes over that fella and says, you look at it one way and we look at it another, but why don't we get together and be kind and not speak harsh of each other and all do the best we can to work together? <laughs> <laughs> You know he does? He goes to that fellow and pulls out his sword and says, Who are you for, us or them? Amen. See that thing? What a clear-cut line. You know who he's in front of there? He's in front of the angel of the Lord. Do you know how many men the angel of the Lord killed in first, Second Kings and Second Chronicles? 184,000 in one night. Joshua going to take him on. <laughs> who are you for, us or them? <laughs> Brave man. Brave man. Kind of the faithful man. Count with a faithful remnant, brave. Are you brave for the Lord? When I sign a Bible, I nearly always sign a Bible with Joshua 1.9. Be strong, good courage, 
Courage, brother, courage. You know what courage is? Courage is armor a blind man wears, the callous scar of outlived despairs. Courage is fear that has said its prayers. That's what courage is. Courage is fear that has said its prayers. You know what some of you ought to do? You ought to go to the biggest, richest town, uh, home in Rochester. I mean, pick you one of these $200,000 things, you know, on about 200 acres with a big old gate out in front, and just go out there past the Cadillac and the, you know, and the Porsche and the Mercedes and bang on the door. <laughs> Somebody come to the door and say, what is it? You say, I just came to buy to see if you're saved. <laughs> Bam! Don't go in your face. <laughs> and somebody says, I just wouldn't have enough nerve to do that. The way you get nerve is by practicing until you get it. Amen. You never be brave. You act like you're brave. <laughs> the trick to being brave is being scared of stiff and going ahead. See, that's the trick. <laughs> the callous scar of outlived despairs, courage is fear, the set its prayers. You take, uh, you, know, you know what uh, Kipling said to the graduates of Oxford one year when he was well up in years and up near retirement and well along. He talked to the young man at Oxford and he said, looking out across the young man, he said, you know, <clears throat> he said, some of you young men look real fancy. Look like you got plenty of money and plenty of upbringing and good breeding and good culture. He said, I can tell some of you from rich homes. And he said, I don't want to have you think too much of money. He said, maybe some of you do. But he said, some of you fellas are going to leave this school <clears throat> and get out in the world. Now, if you've been out in the world about 10 or 15 years, you're going to come across a man sometime, someplace, somewhere, that you can't buy with all the money in the world. Look at me like they expect me to have file teeth and breathe fire. <laughs> but you know what I can't understand about you, Christian? I'll tell you what it is. You've got the Holy Spirit in you. Amen? Amen. You've got the Word of God. Amen? You got a home in heaven, amen? amen? Well, how come you're so chicken? I don't understand it. I've known unsaved men that had more courage than you got. And they didn't have the Holy Spirit in them. They didn't have the Bible. And they didn't have the promise of God. And they didn't know where they were going when they died. I don't understand it. I'll never understand it. I don't understand it right this minute looking at you. I just don't understand it. You sit here tonight, you're well-dressed, got food in your stomach, car outside. Some of you sitting there and saying, what do you got to say that for? I don't like the way he talks. Who thinks talking about? I like to be yelled at. I don't like that kind of language. Shut your mouth, stupid. <laughs> I mean, shut your mouth, maybe you'll learn something. You know, take back in those days in the Army, they didn't, they didn't, that, those were unsaved men out there. And they had to take it and 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 never open their mouth. And these Christians. I don't like the piano. I don't like the music. It's too loud. The colors are too bright. The colors aren't bright enough. I don't like to be shouted at like that. The nursery isn't any good. Why don't they make the parking lot bigger? It's too hot in here. It's too cold. Shut up! I mean, you're not in a hospital, amen? You're not in jail, amen? You're not dead in hell? Oh, let's get the thing in gear. Bravery. God's people ought to be brave, ought to be spirit-filled. You take old Joshua, when he comes back from the land of Canaan and look through the land and observe the thing, and they saw the giants, they come back, and the... Tw and the uh, the ten spies say, we can't make it, we can't make it. There are giants out there. We're like grasshoppers in the sight. We'll get slaughtered. What do you think, Joshua? He said, well, boy, to me, it looks like a real killing opportunity. <laughs> I mean, the bigger they are, the harder they fall, man. See? Courage. Courage. Do you know one reason why General MacArthur got in such trouble with Truman in about that mess in Korea? I mean, according to his own testimony, I've got his diary at home on it. You know, you know what it was? He was at a landing strip one time, one of those strips when a bomber came in, and one of those young men was carried past him on a stretcher there with blood coming out of his nose and out of his ears and 
arm all torn to pieces, and as they went by, MacArthur tried to say something kind to him, and that young fellow rolled over there and looked at MacArthur and said, would you tell me whose side we're on, MacArthur? Whose side we on, General, he said. And he said, whose side is the UN on? And that fixed it. That fixed it. Listen, if a man is brave and wants to win a war, he wants to win it. And if you can't win it, don't start it. All right, now you take old Joshua. He was brave and he was spirit-filled. Take your Bible and turn to Deuteronomy 34.9. Deuteronomy 34.9. Deuteronomy 34.9. The Bible says the spirit that was in Moses was placed in old Joshua. Joshua was a spirit-filled man. He preached to his people. He wasn't just a, a military commander. He preached to his people. There have been great military commanders who did that. I don't know if all of them were saved. I don't know if MacArthur was saved. I know he was a deist. He believed in God. I know he read the Bible. I know that. He probably believed about Jesus Christ. I don't know for sure he was a Christian. Those fellows, their testimony is always kind of kind of thin. You can, can't lay your hand on it. But he wasn't ashamed to pray in front of his troops. I sometimes wonder about Patton. I don't think Patton was a saved man, but he might have been. He'd pray. He'd ask for prayer. He'd carry a Bible on him, and he read the Bible. <laughs> he kid some of the other generals about not reading it. Of course, he's kind of rough. I mean, he'd blankety-blank pretty regular, you know. I thought maybe he's kind of a kind of a rough kind of Christian for the rougher element in the body of Christ. <laughs> I don't know whether the fellow was saved or not. But you take old Joshua, he was a saved man. There are three men that never lost a battle. David and Joshua and Cromwell. Never lost a battle. Those three birds right there. Boy, do the old Catholics hate old Cromwell. What a mean, sorry rascal. Well, he wasn't mean enough to let people worship him. <laughs> he wasn't mean enough when they said, we'll make you king. He backed out and said, I won't be your king. Christ is your king. I know a fellow let you put him on a throne and put a crown on his head, just like a king. And he wasn't Cromwell. You take old Cromwell, when he went into battle, you know what he'd say? He'd pray. And he'd say, Rise, Lord, and let thine enemies be scattered. And off they'd go. Spirit-filled man. All right, finally, take your Bible and turn to Joshua 24, 15. Joshua 24, 15. Finally, old Joshua was faithful unto death. Faithful unto death. I'm trying to get the morale of the troops up, you understand? I'm recruiting tonight. I want somebody to re-up. I want some enlistments. <laughs> I want some soldiers. And I want some guys that will get in there and fight to the drop. You know who my favorite character in the Bible is? But you'd never guess. He's in the Old Testament. His name is Eleazar. You said, well, there's several in there. Yeah, but the one I like is a fellow called Eleazar, the son of Dodo the Ahohite. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> Eleazar, the son of Dodo, the Ahohite. <laughs> you say, well, who was he? He was one of David's mighty men. He fought, and he got in the battle, and he got fighting that thing, and he'd been fighting so long as the muscles in his hand cramped around the sword, and when the fight was all over, they had to pry his fingers off the hilt of that sword where he'd been holding on that thing. And that fellow had been hanging on that sword for so long, he'd become part of the sword. You couldn't tell which was which. You couldn't tell where Dodo quit and that sword began. I sure wish I could be like that. I'd like to be so identified with that book that people blame me for things they want to blame in that book. Amen. I've been to this come here and say, some of these Christian schools, Ruckman, Ruckmanites, Ruckmanite, Ruckmanite. <laughs> Listen, Peter S. Ruckman is not the problem. My middle initial is S. I mean, say, Peter, say, Ruckman. <laughs> and you take, and you take, <clears throat> no, it's not, it's Sturgis. My, my grandfather mother on my mother's side was, uh, was Dutch. Now you take, you take Peter S. Ruckman, he's not the problem. You know why? Who's Peter S. Ruckman? Nobody. He's just an old dead dog that God saved. Don't you tell me Peter Ruckman is the problem. The problem is that book. You know what they, what they don't like? They don't like that book. They like to get rid of that book. It ain't me. It ain't me. 
I tell you, you're watching the only preacher in America whose books are burned at Christian universities. <laughs> they burn them. They burn them. They burn them. I got a letter the other day from my good friend Hugh Pyle, whom I love in the Lord and always will and love and respect. And they put a lot of pressure on him now and trying to get him to get me to back down some things. You know, and he writing and saying, well, you know, uh, dear Brother Pete, you know, if you just present your position a little bit different, I'm sure that many people would accept your position. He said, it's the way you present it. <clears throat> I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I've been an observer of human nature for a long time. You know what I've observed? I've observed when a fellow wants an alibi to do wrong and wants an alibi to sin, I don't care how you put the truth to him, he won't take it. I don't worry about it. You can take it or leave it. You can like it or lump it. You say, we never get anybody that way. Yeah, you'll get some young men who'll take the challenge. When you talk that way, some young fellow's blood will rise up. Well, I'll show him. <laughs> That's what I want you to do. Show me, man, show me. I want to see some soldiers. You know, I try to get these people believe in the Word of God. I don't know why they think a Ruckmanite's anything peculiar. As far as I know, a Ruckmanite, somebody believes that Bible is the Word of God. Why, well, this country's had over four million people that believe that Bible is the Word of God. They don't know sectarian cult. The sectarian cult are the fellows trying to get rid of it. That's the cult. I've tried to reason with them, you know. They won't, they're not reasonable. Uh, I, I've got a good friend named David Otis Fuller, and he's a gentleman, see? You never confuse me with him. And you take old, and you take old David Otis Fuller, he's about six feet uh, two, and he dresses well, nice gray suits, tied just right, never had his hands dirty, you know, like Ruckman. Shoes never scuffed like Ruckman, you know. Always a perfect press down the pants, you know. Always got his bodyguard, right guard on, you know. And that fella, he comes up, oh yeah, ma'am. He comes up and knocks the door of these universities and says, uh, I realize you people are greatly more spiritual than I am, and you do much more, more for Lord than I probably ever will. But there's some things here about the Bible I like to talk about, and if you'd please sit down with me and help me out, bam, they slam a door in his face. They don't sell Fuller's books at the 15 major Christian colleges in America. If you want to get them, you have to get them in your bookstore out there in the lobby. I know another fellow's name is Hills. Hills and Fuller believe what I do about the Texas Receptus. They believe what I do about the Greek manuscripts in church history. And Hills comes up. Hills a fine, sedate, gentlemanly fellow, about uh, 85 years old. Sedate little gentleman, white hair, smile, polite. Has his sleeve, you know, the regulation half inch out here. Always dressed immaculately, you know. He steps up there and knocks the door. He says, gentlemen, I don't wish to start any controversy, and I wish to be moderate and temperate in what I'm about to say. But I have a few facts here which I'd like to have you examine. If you will take the time, bam, they slam a door in his face. Don't you tell me they'll take it with another approach. They won't. So long comes Ruckman. <laughs> and I look at that thing and I say, well, well, well. <laughs> and I put me on some dungarees and a camouflage suit. <laughs> and I take the pant leg and tie it around the rope down the bottom, you know, so don't catch in the bushes. You get me a bicycle chain, you know, so when you lie down, the guy comes over, come up and get him in the face with it, and then you get a, then take a little bit of black, you know, and put it around your cheeks, you know, where the star shell won't light you up at night, and put on a stocking cap so the helmet don't reflect. That's right, man. <laughs> and get your trench knife about that long, by inches long, and then I go in through the basement window. <laughs> and I come up to the cellar stairs, you know, and when I'm going where there's a lot of brush, you know, I put the heel, I put the toe down first, you know, and come down like this. And when the ground is hard, you put the heel down first, you know, and then come in it slow. And I get up in the living room right behind them. They're all looking out the front door. And I come up there and say, boo! <laughs> <laughs> like to scare my death, man. Like to scare my death. <laughs> All right, you take Joshua 24, verse 19. Now look down there. Oh, Joshua's standing up there, and he's given his, uh, I say 19, must be 15. Come think of it. It's 15, isn't it? As for me in my house, is that it? 
15. 24, 15. Joshua comes down to that terrain there and he says, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. If that's your situation, you say, Wait till I ask my wife. No, 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 no. Uh-uh. No, no, uh-uh. Uh-uh. No. See? I mean, that guy is standing up there, and his wife is down there, and his kids are down there, and he's made that woman serve as Mrs. Joshua when he was a slave laborer in a brick foundry for 10 years. That woman washed the dishes and kept house for a slave laborer in a brick foundry in Egypt 10 years. They wandered in the wilderness 40 years, and for 40 years, Mrs. Joshua lived in a tent and smelled the camels and choked on the dust and put up with scorpions and snakes and rebellions. And after they got in the promised land, you think she had any rest? You think she had any relief? When they got in the promised land for 50 years, her husband was in a pitched battle day and night for 50 years, and she never knew whether he'd come back alive the next night or not. Some woman, boy. And Joshua says, uh, as for me and my house, speaking for the missus, we, speaking for the missus, will serve the Lord, period. Why, if that had been some modern fellow, about the time his wife would have said, oh, yeah, <laughs> you know, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Well, you may, but I've had enough of this stuff. I'm getting out and going home to Mama. Blam, out the door. That old boy was a male chauvinist, boy. He said, as for me and my house, don't have to ask my wife nothing. I'll, I'll, I'll speak for her. She won't give the order. I'll tell you what she wants to eat. <laughs> Boy, some of you ladies are... <laughs> E-R-A. <laughs> Eve ruined Adam. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Do you ever stop thinking about this? You know, all this ERA stuff. Do you ever stop thinking how stupid that is? I mean, here's a bunch of women sitting around saying equal rights, equal rights. You ladies couldn't be equal if you tried. You don't have any name. There's not a woman in this building that has her own name. If you're single, you got your father's name, right? If you're married, you got your husband's name, right? What do you mean equal? I mean, here's Mrs. Abzug. Hey, lady, you got a man's name. <laughs> Why, the only way you can make them equal is give your kids the woman's last name, and it'll still be your father's name, unless you change the name every generation. <laughs> All this stuff. He stands up and he says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It'll cost you something, Joshua. It'll cost you something, Mrs. Joshua. And Mrs. Joshua, it may cost you more than it costs him before you get through. Preacher's wives have a time of it. There's been many a young man called the ministry, and his wife has just made up her mind, I will not be a preacher's wife. That's happened more than once. It happened more than twice. There's many a woman that said, well, if I'm a preacher's wife, people look at me close, and I don't want to be looked at close. I want my freedom and I want my liberty and I can't dress right all the time and can't keep the house cleaned up all the time. They get funny ideas about preacher's wives. Let me tell you something. If God called you to preach, you're your husband to preach, you're a preacher's wife, you can be the kind of wife that you ought to be if God called him. God knows what he's doing. I know all kinds of preacher's wives. They're not all real, you know, refined and cultured and neat. And they're still good women and good wives. I've done all kinds of preachers' wives. Man, you realize I've preached in over 800 churches. 800 of them. I've met everything that walks on two legs in the Christian ministry. <laughs> and I've known some preachers' wives that were plain, relaxed, informal, some even rough and crude. And they were good women, and God used them. You better not get any funny ideas in your head about what you've got to be. God will make you what you want to be if you let him. And Joshua got up there and said, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I like an old song. It goes like this. Am I a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb? And should I 
fear to own his cause or blush to speak his name? Must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sail through bloody seas? Are there no foes for me to fight? Must I not stem the flood? Is this vile world a friend of grace to help me on to God? Sure, I must fight if I must win. Increase my courage, Lord. I'll endure the strife and bear the pain supported by thy word. The more and more I know about some unsaved people, the less I think about some Christians. In the Battle of Smolensk, which is near Vyazma, going to Moscow on the Eastern Front, the Russians came in there after a big retreat, and they caught a young lieutenant there by had charge of an 88, and he was sitting there with one arm off here at the shoulder, and the other arm in a sling. And he'd fired his last shot, and his gun crew was dead, and they'd fired all the Mausers and fired all the Lugers. <laughs> And the 88 was out. And that kid was a young fellow sitting there in the snow when they came in. And the Russians put the bayonets on him, about 20 below zero, and said, raise your hands, you know. On the hawk, you know, raise your hands. And you know what that fellow did? He spit on them. Not really about that. Maybe the guy wasn't saved, see? Maybe he was lost. But I'll tell you, that kid had something I need. And listen, if an unsaved man would do that for a demon-possessed dictator and then die and go to hell, what should you do for Jesus Christ, the captain of your salvation? Amen. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Father, I pray you'll speak to hearts some men and women here, boys and girls, tonight. Maybe some of these folks are sold now that can't be roused up anymore. Maybe it's too late. I hope not. I know you called Moses when he was 80. You're probably not through with some of these folks that think you're through with them. And Lord, there's some young men here tonight. And Lord, I pray you raise some troops out of here, raise up an army that'll do business for God. Won't be afraid to face the world, the flesh, and the devil. May they not get big ideas about it. May they remember Joshua's case. That great old soldier of the cross, he even got backslidden. But he was counted with a faithful few and Lord, I pray you bring some tonight. Not us from here, the heads bowed and the eyes closed. In a minute, we're going to sing an invitation here, and I'd like to have us sing when we stand. In a while, have us sing, Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. And I want to call here tonight for some recruits. And I want to see some Christians that haven't been doing for the job for God. Get out of your seat. While you're coming tonight, you're saying, Lord, I'm enlisting for good. I'm here to stay for the duration, and by the grace of God, I go where you want me to go, I say what you want me to say, I do what you want me to do. I'll sell out. I'll sell out. Father, bless the message tonight, bless the Word of God, bless the invitation. You know who's here. I may never even live to see the results. I never know what I'm speaking to. We never do. You know the heart. I don't know the heart. But I pray you put your hand down here tonight, Lord, and raise up some young men that'll do better than I'm doing and better than I'm going to do. And some of these young men have advantages I never had, Lord. Some of them raised in Christian homes. I wasn't. I wasted 27 years of my life, Lord, just down the drain. You got some young man here that hasn't wasted it yet. He's already saved. Maybe he's 10 or 15. He got all the years ahead of him. Now, Lord, put your hand on him. Get him. Speak to him. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we're going to stand here in just a minute and sing, Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Before we stand, just a minute before we stand, I want to say this just in closing. Before we stand, right after I've been saved, I guess about uh, two months, I was in a library of a school and I picked up a magazine. And it was a magazine on army enlistment. In the back of that magazine, there was a picture of soldiers training at Fort Benning, Georgia. And it was a bunch of inf infantrymen going across the hill in a simulated gas attack. And when you looked at the back of those infantrymen, you couldn't tell them apart. All the helmets looked the same. All the packs looked the same. Some might have been six feet two, some of them five feet six, but after a while, they just blend together and they all looked the same. And you saw that picture of those fellows going across that field in that smoke with the bayonets on, bayonets port. And I looked at that thing, I've only been saved a few months. And as I looked at that thing, 
it seemed like the Holy Spirit put a finger right down there, one of those fellows, and said, hey, you, you. I could almost see one of those dog faces turn around like this, you know. Who, me? I mean, just one in the ranks. They all look like peas in a pod. The Lord said, yeah, you, I want you. And God reached in there and took me out of that army, and he put me in the right army. I'm in the good one. I got the right commander. I got the best retirement plan you ever saw. <laughs> Let's stand and sing, Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Sing it. Have thine own way. This thing here lies between you and the Lord, see? I may, maybe some of you fellows are up in years. I'm not saying you're backslidden. Maybe you love the Lord and you're spiritual. But maybe some of you older fellows are past the place where you can be stirred up. I guess the older you get, the harder it is to stir them up. You see too much. You're disillusioned. That's why I appeal to the young men. Doesn't mean you're hopeless. There may be men in this building 50, 55, 60, 65, 70. You can still enlist, and God will still use you every day of your life. That's what I'm asking you for. And I'll sell out, sell out. You say, what do you promise me, Ruckman? Well, bombardment, 104 fever, <laughs> ammunition supply blown up, blew up your pack, and you can't get your toothbrush and your soap out of it, stuck in the mud, break your ankle, march five miles, artillery barrage, bury your friends. That's what you get, combat. Didn't like parade. Gun jams on you. <laughs> I want you to sell out. If you're saved, if you're saved tonight, this call for you if you're saved is this. This call is, will you come down here, and by your coming down here tonight, say, Lord, from here on, you can have all the rest of it there is to have. By that I mean... Wherever he says go, you're going to go. Whatever he says say, you're going to say. Whatever he says do, you're going to do. You say, Ruckman, if I do that, it may cost me a family. Okay, bye bye. Listen, I've known guys go overseas and not see their families for 44 months and did that for the government. Now, I'm not talking about whether you can do it, see. We all know you can't. I'm asking you, are you willing? Are you willing? And if you're willing, when you come down here tonight, by your coming down, your dedication, say, Lord, from here on, you can have it. No more of my will, your will. No more of my way, your way. Tough, tough. I'm not going to get mad if you don't come. I'm not going to be ashamed of you if you don't come. I'm going to ask you to do the toughest thing anybody ever asked you to do. And I know it. If God Almighty came in here, walked down this aisle right now and said, Pete, I want to have you resign that school down there and go up to Fairbanks, Alaska and open a rescue mission for drunks. Man, like a fellow said, I'd have to pray about it. <laughs> I'd like to have a heart attack. That'd be so difficult for me, I don't even, I'd even manage it. Manage it. But I've told the Lord, what you say from here on, what you want from here on is yours. And okay, that's it. Let's go. Let's sing the first stanza again. Have thine own way, Lord, while we, while we sing. Have thine own way. Have thine own Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Lord, have thine own Thank you. 
listing one more stand in a minute, and then we're going to close. Now, here's the thing. Are you, are you one of them the Lord can count on? You're going to be faithful, faithful, not successful, faithful, faithful, faithful. I hope you're successful. If you're not faithful, faithful unto death. I was down in the hospital in Pensacola a couple of years back, and somebody said there's a crowd down there named Kreutzer. And he said, we try to win the Lord. He's a Lutheran, but he's an atheist. How about going out and talk to him? I went down there and came and talked to him. He sat down. He was a kraut of the krauts. He had that old shovel jaw, you know, blonde hair, kind of washed out, blue eyes, kind of pale, not too tough looking, you know. Those fellows are fooey, you know. They don't look too tough physically, but they'll blow your head off, man. And he was sitting there, you know, and he'd had some kind of trouble, and I got talking with him, and I couldn't get anywhere with him, and he was a gentleman. He was real nice. He said, well, that's right, but, and, but that's right, but, but I was raised, but you see if you're raised like a, you know, that kind of thing. And after about 15 minutes, I got tired of it, and I said, I'm going to get a rise out of this bird one way or another. <laughs> and I said, uh, I said, you in the German army? He said, yeah. I said, uh, I fought for the Rommel. And if they ever fought with Rommel, they'll tell you. He said, I fought for the Rommel. I said, were you at El Alamein or Catherine Pass or El Agadia? Where were you? And boy, he began to shift in that bed, and his eyes began to light up, and he said, I fought at El Alamein. Alamein, Alamein. He said, everybody in that place was his own general. And he said, we'd have won that battle if it hadn't been for the petrol, but you know about the Pope and the petrol. <laughs> See? And I know all about the Pope and the petrol, but I knew the gasoline came down from Italy to Africa, and I know if somebody in Italy wanted to mess it up in Africa, they'd just stop it from coming. See, I knew that. And that fellow began to raise his voice in that hospital and shake that blonde hair at me and shook his fist, and he said, and I'll tell you something else. He said, if he'd had the petrol, we'd have won. <laughs> I looked at that fellow and just marveled. And well, I said, man, that battle was 25 years ago. <laughs> and there that guy, there that guy there sitting there, and that thing just fresh in his mind, and he's ready to go again. Ready to go again. I left that hospital and I said, God, I sure wish you'd put that in some of your people. I hope God put it in you tonight. That fellow wasn't even saved. Let's sing one more stand. The first stand again. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou at the potter, this is going to be it. Now, if you're not saved, the person the work is here leads you to Christ. The invitation is still open if you're unsaved. But mainly, I'm asking you tonight, if you're a Christian, to sell out. Put your name on the bottom line. Hand the piece of paper to him. Let him fill it out any way he wants to fill it out. All right, let's sing. Have thine own own way, You're going to come. Come on. We're going to close. Come on, I get some courage. Get some backbone. Ask God to make you a soldier. All right. Brother, you take it over. Let a brother here close the service. The Lord leads him. Come ahead.